friends and fans of the podcast. Today's featured artist is someone that I really feel like I can identify with. Uh, He's from Massachusetts. He's a producer, a songwriter. He plays multiple instruments. This man is from Duxbury, Massachusetts, and he took things to a new level. His amazing talent, great songwriting ability, great ear for production, and his drive turned Scott Woodruff, the main man in the band Stick Figure, into one of the best one-man band DIY indie artists of all time. I know that's like, that's saying a lot, but just hear me out. Why do I say this, first of all? And why should we be sharp and see Stick Figure? Well, it is just simply true. The man is pretty amazing. After he had the ability to play a few instruments, which is common in people who have that producer mindset, they end up playing more than one instrument. After he really, you know, began to to, to master his craft with his instruments, he began writing and recording his own music. Now, when I say recording music, I don't mean he went across the room, pressed the record button on the Sony tape player, and then ran across the room, grabbed his guitar, and started strumming and singing. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean layering tracks and different instruments, loops, sounds, one track at a time to be able to, in the end, have a completely finished album with many completed songs on it. You would listen to this album and think that he had a team of songwriters, musicians, engineers, and producers, but no. Woodruff did it all on his own. I also consider him to be lucky in a way, because at a young age, he found out where he fit in music, and that seems like something small or easy to achieve, but some people stagger in and out of genres trying to find their way, myself included, but not Scott. Reggae dub was his calling, and he answered in a big, big way. He started his own label in 2007 under the name Roughwood and released his first studio album, The Sound of My Addiction, where he did everything, simply put, everything. A year later, he releases Burning Ocean under his own label, and it goes to top 10 in the iTunes reggae charts. Let's just stop here, okay? This is a dude in his home studio. Now, anyone can have a home studio nowadays. When I say in his home studio, no, he wasn't the son of Bob Ezrin, some famous music producer. No, he had his computer and a guitar and a keyboard, probably a MIDI controller. He was self-taught. He decides to write, produce, and publish his songs from his house. And his second album goes to the iTunes Top 10 Reggae Charts. That's unheard of. From his house, with no one helping him, and with no proper training either. But his music struck a chord with a ton of people and for good reason even his early stuff is just really nice to listen to it has great bass great percussive beats great guitar licks and he knew how to use his voice and i'll be honest i love the high amount of reverb and delay he uses on his vocals it fits the genre perfectly and kind of adds a little bit of that dreamy feel to the music and he doesn't just turn on delay and just leave it on and then sing with echo. He doesn't do that. He will go in probably after he's, I mean, more than likely, because I've done this, after he recorded the, um, the vocal track, you go in and you add delay in specific places. Just a little bit here, a little bit there. It's not throughout the song. Something else that he does too is that he'll vary the kind of delay he uses. So this amazing attention to detail in his music is it's what makes good music great and it shows. I'll give you an example. The song Burning Ocean. He decided to use delay like at the end of one of the verses that he sang and this delay had like a metallic distorted echo and it was used once in the song. 
I think it was only used once. But it, it, my point is that it was not just turned on and he sang over it and that was it. And it was delay all over the place. He used it in specific spots. This is the attention to detail that gets you in the top 10. Now, for his third album, he's living in San Diego. He releases the album Smokestack from there. And you can hear now he's getting better. And you can hear that he's perfecting his producing. And it's amazing. It's not like his first album was bad and, oh, now he figured out how to, how to write music. No, he just, he came out of the gate with some great music and great production, but he just continued to perfect the craft. He steadily improved with time. The dude was dedicated. Smokestack was released midway through 2009. So we have three years, three albums, and these songs on these albums aren't fillers. They're good songs. Woodruff will go on to create two more albums, two years apart. It brings us to 2012, and we can see that he was collaborating with TJ O'Neill on uh, some of these songs that he releases on his fifth studio album. This album continues to climb high on the reggae charts, and now he starts touring. So now after five years doing almost everything alone in a studio, he forms a band and begins to share a little bit of the spotlight, but don't don't kid yourself. There's no hiding it. Without Woodruff, there's no stick figure. Everyone knows it. They, when, when you find a good songwriter and you're able to support him, and help him uh, with whether it's live music or even help him in the studio. Uh, the, the main person behind the songwriting is a very valuable piece of the puzzle, and Woodruff was stick figure. Without Woodruff, there is no stick figure, plainly put. Something happened in 2019, or well, between 2015 to 2019, something happened. I don't know what it is, and I ain't kidding. His stuff was already good, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't be doing this episode if I didn't think his stuff was great. However, 2019, he releases the album World on Fire, and it's head and shoulders above everything else. The songwriting, the arrangement, the production. It is simply a phenomenal album. I don't know what he did. It spent four weeks on number one for the reggae charts. It was the highest selling debut week album of the year in 2019. So the first week it debuted, it outsold everything else that was debuted in its first week. He even outsold the previous year's winners. Maybe you know them, Shaggy and this guy named Sting. Hmm, I don't know. Now I know music is a personal thing, and I know it is so organic that any change in someone's life can affect the music for better or for worse. What the heck made World on Fire so great? This is like one of my favorite albums, period. This album was created in the studio in Oakland, California that used to belong to Green Day. So was that it? Green Day's magic touch? Doubt it. He also collaborated with a producer on this album, Johnny Cosmic, who happens to play guitar with them when they when they um, when when they travel as a band. He is their he is one of their guitarists. I honestly don't know what changed. I don't know what changed, but to me, there's Stick Figure, great artist, great songwriter. Okay, then there's Stick Figure, World on Fire. I mean, could it be that it was co-produced by Johnny Cosmic? I don't know. Here is what I think makes this album so amazing. And now, yes, now I'm going to mention some songs by name. Let's pick the song Shine. Okay, the song Shine. There's times when they stop that organ stabbing that you normally get in reggae. And then it starts again. And when it stops, the listener knows something was taken away. But they don't focus on it because then something's added. Like great vocals with great reverb and delay on them or a great bass line so there was more focus in this album on taking stuff away at the proper time it sounds like overly simplistic it is gigantically important if you have a a, a part of a song that you want the listener to focus in on then remove some other parts 
and the listener knows something changed, so they pay extra attention to the song, but then right then, you're introducing the thing you want them to pay attention to. It's a perfect tactic in songwriting and production, and a lot of that is in this album. And it's like that in the song Shine. It's just perfectly placed. And then there's a little guitar riff in the beginning of the song that creates the identity of the song. There's more focus on hooks in this album than any of his previous albums. It's just that amazing. It's head and shoulders above the rest of the albums. There's uh, vocal tracks where he actually dubs the track, so he actually sings over himself. There's the perfect amount of echo on the vocals. Uh, and there's sometimes like a little riff that will come in after he sings each line in the chorus. So what this does is this, this creates an identity for the song. At his previous albums, they had good songs on it, but not every song had its own identity. And when you do that to a song, I'm not saying every song needs that. But when you do that to a song, the listener creates a deeper connection with it. I'll give you an example. Um, the beginning of the song, uh, Wrapped Around My Finger by Sting, right? I'm not doing it right. Um, but... There's, there's like this little keyboard hook at the beginning of the song and then it comes back in the middle of the song and then it comes back in the end of the song and I believe there are traces of it during the song but nothing serious but just traces of it something saying I'm still here it's like an identification for the song and it comes back it comes in and out and he started doing this to like the nth degree I'm not saying he never did it in his other music I'm just saying it stands out in this album. Now, it doesn't just end with the song Shine. You know, it's really every song on the album. The song All For You. Like, what the heck, man? Again, the perfect amount of echo on the voice. More than the other albums. I swear, I went back and listened to other albums. This album, they really focused on the effects for his vocals, and it just, it worked. Whatever they did, whatever he did, it worked. There are very identifiable licks, too, at the beginning of the song. You can tell, like, there's like this, um, I don't know if it's maybe like a, um, like a blues organ type of sound, and it, like, slightly stabs a chord in the first verses. Like, kind of after he sings, or just before he sings a verse, you hear, like, this little thing... Um, and, and, but it dances around throughout the song and at times you can't, it's not there. And it, it, it's just a little thing. It's a little part of the song, but it's, it's so identifiable and the listener notices it. And then when it's gone, the listener doesn't care, but then it comes back. It, it's just little things like this that make you want to replay the song when it ends. The song Above the Storm. Like what the heck? It starts off perfect there's a synthesized lead giving us a hook to like identify with then the singing starts with decreased beats but the beats bounce back at the perfect time and, and that's something he does in this album he starts singing and they take away percussion they might take away something else so all you hear is like light percussion bass and vocals he sings a verse and then the rest of the percussion comes back this kind of production when the vocals come in the reggae and the, the, the chord stabbing stops and the percussion decreases and you hear mostly just bass and vocals, that is top-notch production right there. Where a part of a song reaches out and grabs your attention. That's exactly why I like Pink Floyd so much. It's that attention to detail. And Stick Figure hit the nail on the head with this album. Now this is in 2019. So again, I ask, what the heck happened? From what I understand, if I did my math correctly, and I, I did look at different websites, and I looked at his own personal website, I believe this is a five-year difference be between albums. I think the album before this was 2014, and then I think he did some touring. So he might have grown over time. Something happened in this five-year period that when he produced, when he wrote and produced this album, Scott Woodruff is now in another universe when it comes to his music. It's just splendid. 
You get that right. I just used the word splendid. Listen to the song The Great Unknown on this album. There's like little riffs in the beginning of the song, and it's 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 perfectly following the chord changes too. So it's like that attention when the, the beginning riff or hook of the song follows the chord changes. It'll, it'll play a note that's in the scale, but also in the chord, or maybe out of the scale, but but it's a chord tone. So you the riff is more identifiable with the song, which makes it more identifiable to the listener. Then he starts singing, and again, a bunch of stuff pulls away from the background. So now you just focused in on his voice. But then after one verse, bam! The rest of the background music comes stabbing back in. And when he sings the chorus, this is what I think is brilliant. When he sings the chorus of the song, it is the opening riff that you heard when the song started. So it's, it's things like this. It's that songwriting style. Here's an opening riff to the song. Okay, the singing comes in. Pull away some instruments so you can focus in on his voice. And oh, when I sing the chorus, I'm going to sing the same exact notes that I used when I opened the song. It's just brilliant. It's really seriously songwriting and production at its best. Even the bridge in the song stands out more. It has like a blues feel, and you can tell he does this thing in the song where he begins to resolve from like five to one, and it hits you in the heart. You know, when, you, when I say resolve, I'm talking about going back to the root note that the key of the song is in. So like, for instance, um, the, the song is in C minor. When you resolve a phrase, and it's that note that just hits you in the heart, that's a C. He's resolving to the root right there, right? But there's certain chords you can play before you resolve. How you get to that C is important. And he does, you can just, he almost like employs a little bit of blues just for this one part of the song. It just hits you in the heart. All right, I want to give you a little bit of an example as to what I'm talking about when it comes to resolving. Let's just say the song is in C minor. Okay, that's the C minor chord. This is the C note. So when the song is over and you hit this, that's going to just feel right. You're going to know that that's the key of the song. That's what the song is in, C minor. Now, let's just say he's, you know, doing C minor to F minor to G major. Can't you feel it's going back to the C minor? And then it resolves to C minor. I love you, but I, oh, I am afraid. So what I did there was the chord before the C minor was G major. So C minor. resolves and you kind of get the feel and I don't know I didn't actually look at the chords I didn't play along with his music but it has that it has that feel that five to one feel to it you know um, and that's what I'm talking about when I say five to one and what I like is that sometimes like right here, I sing the B. Afraid. And the B is just one half step below the C. So when you sing that note, ah, there's, there's only one place you can really go with it, and that's back to the root, because you just created that tension. The listener is now emotionally involved in the fact that you're about to resolve. If... Afraid. It's not going to work. Afraid. No, you have to. Afraid. Because you're creating that tension. You're taking it in your, your songwriting to that point in the song. So I, I hate to get technical, but I, I want to explain one of some of the reasons why I think that this, that this album is just head and shoulders above the rest. He just employs a whole slew of things that I didn't really catch in the other albums. 
And it's it just goes to show that he kept his mind open and was willing to try new things and still continues to try to master the craft even after all these years. He knows that there's no end. There's no end to the learning. There's no end uh, to what you can add to your music. And I love musicians that do that. Yes, it's reggae, and reggae gets classified into like the feel good, oh, let me have a beer and just sit down on the beach type of music. And that's fine. Trust me, I like listening to reggae when I'm at the beach. Don't get me wrong. But there's a lot of work and thought into each song. And, And Scott, in this album here, in the studio, sat down, and I, I can guarantee he put a lot of thought and a lot of hard work into these songs. The final product is nice. And yes, I'll, I can sit down to the beach, crack open a beer, and listen to this music in the background. Okay, but th- this, is, this is not just background music. This is, this is art, artfully done if that makes any sense, craftfully created with a lot of hard work. So anyways, okay, enough of my spiel. I'm sorry. Okay, I need to talk about my favorite song on the album now. Uh, I can sit here and analyze this whole entire album all day, and I I don't want to do that. But he's using a writing-producing style that I very much identify with, and he's doing it all within this reggae style, and it's amazing. And I know he's popular now, but I'm not too sure if people actually know when they hear the songs, just how much work is put into each song's production. And I'm, I don't know if people hear certain parts of the song and think, oh, that was nice. And they understand the work put behind it. Again, let's go to my favorite song on the album, World on Fire. My favorite song by him, period. The song starts off again with a perfectly placed organ riff. He starts singing with the decreased percussion. So again, the vocals come in and you're like sucked in. It's like a vacuum. But only after one verse. Then the percussion comes back in. And then he goes into the chorus and you're kind of blown away with how his vocals just take you to another place. Now in the beginning of the song, you hear an organ riff. And this is the identity of the song. Now, you're, you're expecting this riff to come back, but he's not doing it. Like in the song, The Great Unknown, he sung that riff in the chorus. The, the riff or the hook started the song, and then when he sang the chorus, he danced around those notes, right? Even though that it was played on a different instrument. He doesn't do that here. He sings the verses, he sings his chorus, which is just a beautiful chorus, But then after the chorus, then you hear that hook come back in, that organ hook. And he employs an excellent technique. It's done on purpose. It's why the song is so great. Something else to keep in mind, too. I believe the first time the hook comes back, so after he sings the first chorus, the organ hook comes back. If I'm not mistaken, it's a little bit different. It is almost the same exact notes as the beginning, but just different enough. But it never loses its identity. You know that you're listening to the personality. The identifying mark of that song is that hook. And you know you're listening to it, right? Now, I can go on forever. I can go on forever. How about the part where Slightly Stupid comes in? This song almost has two bridges because after this second hook, right, he sings the chorus, the hook comes in, then there's like a little bit of a musical interlude. But then, I mean, you know, normally after the second chorus, if there's some type of musical interlude, you kind of you kind of just say that that's the bridge of the song. And Slightly Stupid, you know, who's featured on this album, I mean, on this song, comes in and does some excellent vocal work. And he kind of creates a second bridge. And as any good songwriter does, he closes the song, as Scott does, with the opening organ riff. So it's like a nicely tight package. Here you go. Each song has a much better defined personality and character in this album than anything he has ever done. And I hope he continues with that style. And I'm not saying I don't like it. I like all of his work. But 
you know, I like all of Pink Floyd's work, but I would be crushed if all of a sudden the music to, I don't know, Shine on You Crazy Diamond or the, or the album Animals was no longer available. It just disappeared. It went into some weird spatial void somewhere and you couldn't download those songs. They were just gone. I would be crushed because those to me, Shine on You Crazy Diamond or the album Animals are just some of his best work or some of Pink Floyd's best work, right? Uh, this album, World on Fire by Stick Figure, is by far the best work that he's done. I mean, he already did great work, and that, then he just shot himself into another stratosphere, and he's like, all right, see if I can step up my game, and he did. Now, I can sit here and, you know, I can break down more songs for you, honestly. Go to YouTube, go to his website, go to his YouTube page, go to Spotify, or buy the album. But I don't even, I don't tell anyone to buy albums anymore. Um, I don't know, maybe that's wrong of me. You know, as a songwriter myself, I should be like, yes, buy the album, because I want you to buy my album. But, um, I mean, go to YouTube and just watch it, you know, or or go to Spotify if, if you have an account. Uh, and listen to the album World on Fire. Listen to all of his albums. I actually recommend you go to the beginning. Get like two songs from the first album, two songs from the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on, right? And then compare those songs to the album World on Fire. And you tell me, did, did he, what the heck just happened? Did he just hit the Nitus button and now all of a sudden he's like super producer? I have no idea. But listen to his music. His songs can describe themselves a heck of a lot better than I can. So we need to be sharp and see the amazing music by Scott Woodruff. Yes, stick figure. We need to see how he has evolved over the years. And I'm dying to see what he comes up with next. I know he had a tour scheduled before COVID hit and he had a cancel it. I don't know what his current plans are. Uh, he does have a website, so you can go to it and, and see for yourself what, you know, what he's planning on doing soon. Uh, I just want, I want more music from this guy. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if he was to tour near me, I don't even know if I would see him live. I'm that kind of guy. The, the pure brilliance done in the studio is, is enough for me. But I know, you know, um, performers, and he didn't perform for a while, but performers uh, want to perform, and the listeners want their favorite songwriters to perform because they want to have that close-up feel. And, um, you know, they want to be able to really identify with the musicians. And I'm, I'm, a musician is a person, and a song is written by a person. So I get why he's touring. But the pure brilliance in the studio is what I like and that's that's enough for me you know I'm sure he's great live and I've seen him I've seen some YouTube videos of him just playing acoustic guitar and singing great stuff great talent he's a mastermind in the studio <laughs> a mastermind in the studio he's a great songwriter he is an even greater producer, engineer, whatever you want to call it. It's absolutely amazing. So we have to be sharp and see Stick Figure and the wonderful production that has been taking place over the past years. This is your host, Ari Aster, saying thank you for listening. Oh, before I forget, please follow the podcast on Instagram under Be Sharp and See, on Facebook under, guess what? Be Sharp and See. All right, I'm going to do something very brave here. I'm going to take you out with a song that I wrote as I was feeling inspired by this band. As I was really feeling inspired by Scott Woodruff's songwriting style, I started writing a song myself. Now, of course, I don't sound like him. Um... And my saying that this song was inspired by his style, maybe I'm putting myself out there, right? Because people are going to listen to it and be like, uh, yeah, Artie, nice try. But anyways, uh, I wrote this song years ago, years ago on the piano. But then when I sat down to actually produce it in the studio, that's when I tried to employ some of the tactics that I thought were... Um, you know, that are unique to this type of reggae. Um, so anyways, Treasure Trove of Wisdom, 
Here it is, and thanks again for listening. Until next time, keep it groovy. Looking for some